Hi there. Welcome to my space of make believe. This is where I take a ride on words to anywhere, be anyone, do anything, and you are welcome to join me. So today again, another one from Sui Sin Fa's Mrs. Spring Fragrance, her only book which was published in 1912. It just entered the public domain and so I read you another short story from it. This time it is about a Chinese couple who has a child delivered in China. They then run into complications when they try and bring the child into America even though the father runs a business in the land of dreams. These stories were written in the 1900s and it's about the Chinese who emigrated to America, their joys, trials and tribulations while they try to fit into the new world. If you would like to read along with me, just turn on the captions and you're good to go. All right then, shall we begin? In the Land of the Free, Chapter 1 See, little one, the hills in the morning sun. There is thy home for years to come. It is very beautiful, and thou wilt be very happy there. The little one looked up into his mother's face in perfect faith. He was engaged in the pleasant occupation of sucking a sweet meat, but that did not prevent him from gurgling responsively. Yes, my olive bud, there is where thy father is making a fortune for thee. Thy father, oh, will thou not be glad to behold his dear face? Twas for thee I left him. Yes, the little one ducked his chin sympathetically against his mother's knee. She lifted him onto her lap. He was two years old, a round, dimple-cheeked boy with bright brown eyes and a sturdy little frame. Ah, 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 ooh, ooh, ooh puffed he, mocking a tugboat steaming by. San Francisco's waterfront was lined with ships and steamers, while other craft, large and small, including a couple of white transports from the Philippines, lay at the anchor here and there offshore. It was some time before the Eastern Queen could get docked, and even after that was accomplished, a lone Chinaman, who had been waiting on the wharf for an hour, was detained that much longer by men with the initials USC on their caps, before he could board the steamer and welcome his wife and child. This is thy son, announced the happy Lei Chu. Hom Hing lifted the child, felt off his little body and limbs, gazed into his face with proud and joyous eyes, then turned inquiringly to a customs officer at his elbow. That's a fine boy you have there, said the man. Where was he born? In China, answered Hom Hing, swinging the little one on his right shoulder, preparatory to leading his wife off the steamer. Ever been to America before? No, not he, answered the father with a happy laugh. The customs officer beckoned to another. This little fella, said he, is visiting America for the first time. The other customs officer stroked his chin reflectively. Good day, said Hom Hing. Wait, commanded one of the officers. You cannot go just yet. What more now? asked Hom Hing. I'm afraid, said the first customs officer, that we cannot allow the boy to go ashore. There's nothing in the papers that you have shown us, your wife's papers and your own, having any bearing upon the child. There was no child when the papers were made out, returned Hom Hing. He spoke calmly, but there was apprehension in his eyes and his tightening grip on his son. What is it? What is it? quavered Lei Chu, who understood a little English. The second customs officer regarded her pityingly. I don't like this part of the business, he muttered. The first officer turned to Hom Hing and in an official tone of voice said, seeing that the boy has no certificate entitling him to admission to this country, you will have to leave him with us. Leave my boy? exclaimed Hom Hing. Yes, he will be well taken care of. And just as soon as we can hear from Washington, he will be handed over to you. But, protested Hom Hing, he is my son. We have no proof, answered the man with a shrug of his shoulders. And even if so, we cannot let him pass without orders from the government. He is my son, reiterated Hom Hing, slowly and solemnly. I am a Chinese merchant and have been in business in San Francisco for many years. When my wife told me one morning that she dreamed of a green tree with spreading branches and one beautiful red flower growing thereon, 
I answered her that I wished my son to be born in our country and for her to prepare to go to China. My wife complied with my wish. After my son was born, my mother fell sick and my wife nursed and cared for her. Then my father too fell sick and my wife also nursed and cared for him. For 20 moons my wife cared for and nursed the old people and when they die, they bless her and my son and I sent for her to return to me. I had no fear of trouble. I was a Chinese merchant and my son was my son. Very good, Hom Hing, replied the first officer. Nevertheless, we take your son. No, you not take him. He, my son too. It was Lei Chu. Snatching the child from his father's arms, she held and covered him with her own. The officers conferred together for a few moments. Then one drew Hom Hing aside and spoke in his ear. We silently, Hom Hing bowed his head, then approached his wife. Tis the law said he, speaking in Chinese, and twill be but for a little while, until tomorrow's sun arises. You too, reproached Lei Chu in a voice eloquent with pain, but accustomed to obedience, she yielded the boy to her husband, who in turn delivered him to the first officer. The little one protested lustily against the transfer, but his mother covered her face with her sleeve, and his father silently led her away. Thus was the law of the land complied with. Chapter 2 Day was breaking. Lei Chu had been awake all night, dressed herself, then awoke her husband. "'Tis the morn,' she cried. "'Go, bring our son!' The man rubbed his eyes and arose upon his elbow so that he could see out of the window. A pale star was visible in the sky. The petals of a lily in a bowl on the windowsill were unfurled. "'Tis not yet time,' said he, laying his head down again. "'Not yet time?' Ah, all the time that I lived before yesterday is not so much as the time that has been since my little one was taken from me. The mother threw herself down beside the bed and covered her face. Hom Hing turned on the light and touching his wife's bowed head with a sympathetic hand inquired if she had slept. Slept? She echoed weepingly. Ah, how could I close my eyes with my arms empty of the little body that has filled them every night for more than 20 moons? You do not know, man, what it is to miss the feel of the little fingers and the little toes and the soft round limbs of your little one. Even in the darkness, his darling eyes used to shine up to mine, and often have I fallen into slumber with his pretty babble at my ear. And now I see him not, I touch him not, I hear him not. My baby, my little fat one. Now, 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 consoled Hom Hing, patting his wife's shoulder reassuringly. There is no need to grieve so. He will soon gladden you again. There cannot be any law that would keep a child from his mother. Lei Chu dried her tears. You are right, my husband, she meekly murmured. She arose and stepped about the apartment, setting things to rights. The box of presents she had brought for her California friends had been opened the evening before, and silks, embroideries, carved ivories, ornamental lacquerware, brasses, camphor wood boxes, fans and chinaware were scattered around in confused heaps. In the midst of unpacking, the thought of a child in the hands of strangers had overpowered her, and she had left everything to crawl into bed and weep. Having arranged her gifts in order, she stepped out onto the deep balcony. The star had faded from view, and there were bright streaks in the western sky. Lei Chu looked down the street and around. Beneath the flat occupied by her and her husband were quarters of a number of bachelor Chinamen, and she could hear them from where she stood, taking their early morning breakfast. Below their dining room was her husband's grocery store. Across the way was a large restaurant. Last night it had been resplendent with gay colored lanterns and the sound of music. The rejoicings over the completion of the moon by Kuang Sum's firstborn had been long and loud and had caused her to tie a handkerchief over her ears. She, a bereaved mother, had it not in her heart to rejoice with other parents. This morning the place was more in accord with her mood. It was still and quiet. The revelers had dispersed or were asleep. A roly-poly woman in black satin with long pendant earrings in her ears, looked up from the street below and waved her a smiling greeting. It was her old neighbour, Kue Ho, the wife of the gold embosser. 
Mark Singh. With her was a little boy in yellow jacket and lavender pantaloons. Lei Chu remembered him as a baby. She used to like to play with him in those days when she had no child of her own. What a long time ago that seemed. She caught her breath in a sigh and laughed instead. Why are you so merry? called the husband from within. Because my little one is coming home, answered Lei Chu. I am a happy mother, a happy mother. She patted into the room with a smile on her face. The noon hour had arrived. The rice was steaming in the bowls and a fragrant dish of chicken and bamboo shoots was awaiting Hom Hin. Not for one moment had Lei Chu paused to rest during the morning hours. Her activity had been ceaseless. Every now and again, however, she had raised her eyes to the gilded clock on the curiously carved mantelpiece. Once she had exclaimed, Why so long? Oh, why so long? Then, apostrophizing herself, Lei Chu, be happy. The little one is coming. The little one is coming. Several times she burst into tears, and several times she laughed aloud. Hom Hing entered the room. His arms hung down by his side. The little one, shrieked Lei Chu. They bid me to call tomorrow. With a moan, the mother sank to the floor. The noon hour passed. The dinner remained on the table. Chapter 3 The winter rains were over. The spring had come to California, flushing the hills with green and causing an ever-changing pageant of flowers to pass over them. But there was no spring in Lei Chu's heart, for the little one remained away from her arms. He was being kept in a mission. White women were caring for him. And though for one full moon he had pined for his mother and refused to be comforted, he was now apparently happy and contented. Five moons or five months had gone by since the day he had passed with Lei Chu through the Golden Gate. But the great government at Washington still delayed sending the answer, which would return him to his parents. Hom Hing was disconsolately rolling up and down the balls in his abacus box when a keen-faced young man stepped into his store. What news? asked the Chinese merchant. This, the young man brought forth a typewritten letter. Hom Hing read the words, Re Chinese child alleged to be the son of Hong Hing, Chinese merchant, doing business at 425 Clay Street, San Francisco. Same will have attention as soon as possible. Hong Hing returned the letter and without a word continued his manipulation of the counting machine. Have you anything to say? asked the young man. Nothing. They have sent the same letter 15 times before. Have you not yourself showed it to me? True, the young man eyed the Chinese merchant furtively. He had a proposition to make, and he was pondering whether or not the time was opportune. How is your wife? He inquired solicitously and diplomatically. Hom Hing shook his head mournfully. She seems less every day, he replied. Her food she takes only when I bid her, and her tears fall continually. She finds no pleasure in dress or flowers and cares not to see her friends. Her eyes stare all night. I think before another moon, she will pass into the land of spirits. No, exclaimed the young man, genuinely startled. If the boy does not come home, I lose my wife, sure continued Hom Hing with a bitter sadness. It's not right, cried the young man indignantly. Then he made his proposition. The Chinese father's eyes brightened exceedingly. Will I like you to go to Washington and make them give you the paper to restore my son? cried he. How can you ask when you know my heart's desire? Then, said the young fellow, I will start next week. I am anxious to see this thing through, if only for the sake of your wife's peace of mind. I will call her. To hear what you think to do will make her glad, said Hom Hing. He called a message to Lei Chu upstairs through a tube in the wall. In a few moments, she appeared, listless, wan, and hollow-eyed. But when her husband told her the young lawyer's suggestion, she became as one electrified. Her form straightened, her eyes glistened, the color flushed to her cheeks. Oh, she cried, turning to James Clancy, you are a hundred man good. The young man felt somewhat embarrassed. His eyes shifted a little under the intense gaze of the Chinese mother. Well, we must get your boy for you, he responded. Of course, turning to Hom Hing, it will cost a little money. You can't get fellows to hire the government for you without gold in your pocket. Hom Hing stared blankly for a moment. Then, how much do you want, Mr. Clancy? He asked quietly. Well, 
I will need at least 500 to start with. Hom Hing cleared his throat. I think I told you the time I last paid you for writing letters for me and seeing the custom boss here that nearly all I had was gone. Oh well then, we won't talk about it, old fella. It won't harm the boy to stay where he is. And your wife may get over it all right. What did you say? quivered Lei Chu. James Clancy looked out the window. He says, explained Hom Hing in English, that to get our boy, we have to have much money. Money. Oh, yes, Lei Chu nodded ahead. I have not got the money to give him. For a moment, Lei Chu gazed wonderingly from one face to the other. Then, comprehension dawning upon her, with swift anger, pointing to the lawyer, she cried, You not one hundred men good, you just common white man. Yes, ma'am, returned James Clancy, bowing and smiling ironically. Hom Hing pushed his wife behind him and addressed the lawyer again. I might try, said he, to raise something, but five hundred? It is not possible. What about four? I tell you, I have next to nothing left, and my friends are not rich. Very well. The lawyer moved leisurely toward the door, pausing on its threshold to light a cigarette. Stop, white man! White man, stop! Lei Chu, panting and terrified, had started forward and now stood beside him, clutching his sleeve excitedly. You say you can go to get paper to bring my little one to me if Hom Hing give you five hundred dollars? The lawyer nodded callously. His eyes were intent upon the cigarette, which would not take the fire from the match. Then you go get paper. If Hom Hing not can give you five hundred dollars, I give you perhaps what more that much. She slipped a heavy gold bracelet from her wrist and held it out to the man. Mechanically, he took it. I go get more. She scurried away, disappearing behind the door through which she had come. Oh, look here. I can't accept this, said James Clancy, walking back to Hom Hing and laying down the bracelet before him. It's all right, said Hom Hing seriously. Pure China gold. My wife's parent gave it to her when we married. But I can't take it anyway, protested the young man. It is all same as money, and you want money to go to Washington, replied Hom Hing in a matter-of-fact manner. See, my jade earrings, my gold buttons, my hairpins, my comb of pearl, and my rings. One, two, three, four, five rings. Very good, very good. All save much money. I give them all to you. You take and bring me paper for my little one. Lei Chu piled up her jewels before the lawyer. Hom Hing laid a restraining hand upon her shoulder. Not all, my wife, he said in Chinese. He selected a ring, his gift to Lei Chu, when she dreamed of the tree with the red flower. The rest of the jewels he pushed toward the white man. Take them all and sell them, said he. They will pay your fare to Washington and bring you back with the paper. For one moment, James Clancy hesitated. He was not a sentimental man. But something within him arose against accepting such payment for his services. They are good, good, pleadingly asserted Lei Chu, seeing his hesitation. Whereupon he seized the jewels, thrust them into his coat pocket, and walked rapidly away from the store. Chapter 4 Lei Chu followed after the missionary woman through the mission nursery school. Her heart was beating so high with happiness that she could scarcely breathe. The paper had come at last, the precious paper which gave Hom Hing and his wife the right to the possession of their own child. It was ten months now since he had been taken from them, ten months since the sun had ceased to shine for Lei Chu. The room was filled with children, most of them wee tots, but none so wee as her own. The mission woman talked as she walked. She told Lei Chu that little Kim, as he had been named by the school, was the pet of the place and that his little tricks and ways amused and delighted everyone. He had been rather difficult to manage at first and had cried much for his mother. But children so soon forget and after a month he seemed quite at home and played around as bright and happy as a bird. Yes, responded Lei Chu. Oh yes, yes. But she did not hear what was said to her. She was walking in a maze of anticipatory joy. Wait here, please, said the mission woman, placing Lei Chu in a chair. The very youngest ones are having their breakfast. She withdrew for a moment. It seemed like an hour to the mother. Then she reappeared leading, 
By the hand, a little boy dressed in blue cotton overalls and white soled shoes. The little boy's face was round and dimpled and his eyes were very bright. Little one, ah, my little one, cried Lei Chu. She fell on her knees and stretched her hungry arms towards her son. But the little one shrunk from her and tried to hide himself in the folds of the white woman's skirt. Go away, go away, he bade his mother. The end. How sadly ironic. She finally got her son back and he has forgotten her and moved on. The sacrifice is made but as quickly and easily. Let's hope he gets settled with his mother again. Perhaps there will be another story to tell us of it. I hope so. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed the story. Please do come back for more. Till next time, go grab a book to read or a pen to write and let your imagination take you anywhere. Be anyone, do anything.